When we talk about the greatest coaches in MMA, we think of names like Faraz Zahabi, Greg Jackson, Javier Mendez, Trevor Whitman, and Eugene Behrman. But there is one coach who has been in the game for years, and in my opinion, he gets overlooked quite a bit. And that is a man who has turned three fighters in three different generations into UFC champions. He has also coached prominent fighters who have made or are making a name for themselves in their divisions. And that coach is Ray Longo, a man from Long Island, New York, who helped Matt Serra become the UFC welterweight champion in a fight which was regarded by many as the greatest upset of all time. After this, Ray and Matt joined together to create Serra Longo Fight Team. And with all the success this team has found, especially at the time of making this video, you would think that they would be regarded as one of the best gyms in MMA. But once again, Ray Longo's work hasn't been appreciated as much as I think it should. And that's why I wanted to make this video. Not only to go through all of Ray's accomplishments over the years, but to also answer why I think he is so underrated. Now let's get to it. The New York native Ray Longo had shown interest in martial arts ever since he was a kid. He started off by training in boxing and would follow that by training in other martial arts. Although his love was with martial arts, he focused more of his time on school by graduating from St. John's University in 1980. This led to him becoming a full full-time accountant, but during his nights, he would train a few fighters at his gym, Longo's International Martial Arts Academy. He would train his students in Jeet Kune Do, boxing, and grappling. But it was in his early 90s when things changed for Ray, as he met a 17-year-old fighter named Matt Serra at Oishi Judo Gym in New York City. The two became immediate friends, and this led to Ray inviting Matt to his gym to train on his striking since Matt was already skilled in BJJ. And soon, Matt would go pro by making his MMA debut on April 1st, 1998, and he looked promising early on by going 4-0 on local cards in New York. But then he made it to the UFC, and in his debut fight with the promotion, he got knocked out by Shoney Carter. Although Matt bounced back with two wins, he then went on to lose his next two, then win two more before losing again thus bringing his overall UFC record to 4-4, four and four, which yes, is not impressive and it was clear that Matt was probably not going to become a big name in the promotion. But then in 2006, Matt became a contestant on the fourth season of The Ultimate Fighter, which was a season that was composed of UFC fighters that had yet to win a title. Basically, it was a season for fighters who have had average runs with the UFC and were looking to make a comeback by winning the show. So after winning two fights in the house, with one of them being a a rematch to Shoney Carter, Matt made it to the Ultimate Fighter finale where he fought and defeated Crystal Idol by split decision, thus making Matt the Ultimate Fighter Season 4 winner. But not only did the winners of this season win $200,000, but they also got immediate shots at the title in their respective divisions. Travis Luter, who was the Ultimate Fighter winner for the middleweights that season, fought champion Anderson Silva and got absolutely obliterated. So honestly, the same was expected to happen with Matt against the newly crowned welterweight champion, George St. Pierre. And the odds proved it because Matt was an 11-1 to underdog heading into this fight. George was seen by many as the future of the sport, so there was no way that Matt was going to stop that hype. But with Ray Longo in his corner, Matt was able to stun George midway through the first round with a huge right hand. George tried to survive, but Matt kept connecting before finally getting the finish with ground and pound, making him the new UFC welterweight champion. This was also Matt's first finish by strikes, and Matt credits Ray for coming up with the game plan to defeat George. This was also Ray Longo's first fighter to capture UFC gold, which of course was a massive accomplishment, but I think this win often gets seen as a fluke win. This was one of the biggest upsets in history because many expected George to absolutely demolish Matt. And that's exactly what happened when the two fought for a second time. So even though Ray and his fighter captured gold, it wasn't for too long. And what made this win feel even more like a fluke were the years after. Matt went 1-2 and two after losing to George and would go on a career hiatus due to the birth of his second child and the rigors of training. Other fighters on the team like Pete Sell didn't find too much success with the UFC as he went 3-5 and five with the promotion. So overall, it seemed like Ray Longo's success as a coach in MMA was going to be a flash in the pan. But with Matt no longer fighting much, he soon decided to become a coach alongside Ray, and the two would create Sarah Longo Fight Team. 
And in 2009, they began training three young prospects from New York in Gian Vellante, Ali Quinta, and Chris Weidman. And early on, all of them seemed promising as they all became Ring of Combat champions in their respective divisions. Gian went on to sign with Strike Force, and after going 3 and 2 with the promotion, he made his way to the UFC once Strike Force got bought out. And although he seemed promising early on, he would never break through as an MMA fighter, and after going 17 and 14, he called it a career. Ally Quinta, on the other hand, became a contestant on the 15th season of The Ultimate Fighter. And although he made it all the way to the finals, he lost. Regardless, he found success afterwards, and after going 8 and 1 in the UFC following the Ultimate Fighter finale, he got the call to fight for the vacant UFC lightweight championship against Habib Nurmagomedov on a day's notice after Tony Ferguson pulled out due to injury. Al was in a position to pull off a massive upset just like how Matt Serra did. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, that didn't happen, but his stock definitely rose after this fight due to his toughness. And it seemed like his momentum was only going up after he bounced back with a very impressive win against Kevin Lee. But afterwards, Al lost his next three and ended up retiring in 2021. But it was Chris Weidman who really lived up to his potential. The former NCAA Division I All-American made his debut with the UFC in 2011 after going 4-0. He was 26 years old and he truly seemed to have a lot of potential and he did that by winning five in a row with three of those wins being finishes. That win against Mark Munoz was not only very brutal, but it also made me believe that Chris was going to become the next middleweight champion, which was a very tough thing to do at this point as the champion, Anderson Silva, was dominating the 185 pound division for years. He was viewed as the GOAT by many at this point. So even though Chris was looking very good early on and was seen to be a bad matchup for Anderson, that didn't mean he was the favorite. But just like Matt, Chris pulled off the upset by knocking Anderson Silva out and becoming the new UFC middleweight champion, thus ending the six-year drought for Ray Longo. But even this win wasn't respected much as many believe that Chris got lucky. Maybe not to the same extent as Matt vs GSP, but people believed Anderson lost this fight because he was clowning around too much and that if the two were to fight again, Chris would lose. But the media rematch did happen and once again, Anderson lost. But the talk about Chris winning due to being lucky didn't simmer down because the second fight with Anderson ended unceremoniously after Anderson broke his leg. So even though Chris defeated one of the greatest fighters of all time twice, I thought he didn't really get the respect he deserved. Even when he followed up with title defenses against legends like Lyoto Machida and Vitor Belfort, I still feel like he didn't get that recognition. Especially since people would say Lyoto gave him a hard time and Vitor wasn't on the juice for their fight. And it sucks that Chris Chris didn't get that love that I thought he should have gotten during his prime because after the Vitor fight, he lost his championship to Luke Rockhold in a brutal beatdown that seemed to have changed Chris as a fighter. Because afterwards, he went 2-5 and five in his next 7 fights, with a few of those defeats being brutal knockouts and with his fight against Uriah Hall ending with Chris breaking his leg like how Anderson did against Chris. That was his last fight and although he's not calling it a career yet, I think it's clear that at this point, Chris's best days are behind. Behind him. But as this generation of Team Sarah Longo came to an end, a new generation was beginning. Because in the early 2010s, Ray and Matt began training two bantamweight prospects in Aljamain Sterling and Marab Devalishvili. Aljamain also became a Ring of Combat champion early on, and afterwards, he captured the CFFC Bantamweight Championship. After going 8 0, he signed with the UFC, and right away, he showed a lot of promise by winning his first four fights. But then he lost his next two fights by split decision. And after these defeats, Aljamain admitted that he was close to calling it a career. But he bounced back after this losing streak with two straight wins. One of them being against former UFC bantamweight champion Henan Barrao. This was huge and it seemed like Aljo was back on track. But then after this win, he got brutally knocked out by Marlon Marais in 67 seconds. Aljamain was back to square one and it was going to be a long road ahead for him if he was going to get to the top and fight for the title. And Aljo put in that work by winning five in a row with the fifth win being a very impressive first round finish against Corey Sandhagen. There was no denying Aljo a shot at the title now, so at UFC 259, he fought Piotr Jan. 
And although Aljamain had his moments, overall, it was Piotr who was controlling the action, and it seemed like he was on his way to winning by decision. But then in the fourth, Piotr connected with a knee to Aljamain's head while Aljamain was a downed opponent. Aljo seemed to be in a lot of pain, and after some time, he was unable to continue, and because of this, he won the fight by disqualification thus making him the new UFC bantamweight champion and the first fighter to capture UFC gold by disqualification. This was Ray's third UFC belt, but of course, this win was trashed by a majority of people. Aljamain was not respected whatsoever. In fact, he became one of the most hated UFC fighters of all time. So to many, he was the fake champ, and it was only a matter of time before Aljo fought Piotr in a rematch and lost his belt. But instead, Aljo silenced many by winning the rematch. It was very impressive, but once again, there were many people who didn't respect Aljo as they thought Piotr won this fight. And then in Aljamain's second title defense, he fought former champion TJ Dillashaw. And although Aljo dominated in this fight, it was not viewed as a real win as TJ dislocated his shoulder early on in this fight. Fight. And then most recently, Aljamain broke the record for most title defenses at bantamweight. But it was an accomplishment that hasn't been that appreciated, as many thought Henry Cejudo won the fight. So even though Aljamain is at the top of this very stacked bantamweight division at the time of making this video, it still seems like he can't win with a majority of the MMA fan base. Regardless, he is possibly the most successful champion Ray Longo has ever coached. But Aljo isn't the only bantamweight from Serra Longo who's finding a lot of success, because so is Marab Devalishvili, the Georgian fighter who moved to Long Island to train under Ray and Matt, and he too found success in the ring of combat by becoming the bantamweight champion. And in his first title defense as the champ, Marab knocked out Rafian Stotts in 15 seconds. This win got him signed to the UFC, and although it wasn't looking good for him early on as he lost his first two fights with the promotion, he bounced back with 9 straight wins, and at the time of making this video, he is the number one contender at 1 35. And since he's teammates with Aljo, the two have vowed to never fight each other. So basically, Ray has the bantamweight division on lock with Aljamain Sterling and Marab Devalishvili, which is very impressive considering how good this division is right now. And honestly, when Aljo does leave the division like he said he plans to do, I truly believe Marab can become the new bantamweight champion afterwards. This is the success that Ray Longo is currently having in the UFC, which is probably the most he has had in his coaching career thus far. As Especially when we include Matt the Steamroller for Vola, who has been killing it recently and is coming off of a huge win against Drew Dober, which has gotten him in the top 15 at lightweight. So, right now, Ray Longo as well as Matt Serra are killing it. I really could have included Matt for most of this video, but I wanted to focus more on Ray because at least Matt had some shine when he won UFC gold. Ray Longo deserved a full video dedicated to his accomplishments as an MMA coach. But why is it that I think Ray Longo still doesn't get? the respect he deserves. And honestly, it's because the fighters that he turned into champions also didn't get that respect. Matt Serra's win was seen as a fluke, so was Chris Weidman's to an extent, and even though he found success by defending his belt, his legacy seems to be that guy who beat Anderson Silva. And then with Aljo, that's just been an absolute disaster from the start. Another thing these three have in common was that they beat fan favorites that many thought wouldn't be losing anytime soon. Ray's guys were the underdogs who won, and although sometimes that storyline is fun, sometimes it's not because fans are upset that their favorites lost. And I think that's the case for Matt, Chris, and Aljamain, which is honestly such a shame. These are possibly three of the most underappreciated champions in UFC history, and they're all coached by the same guy. So of course it wouldn't be too crazy to say that Ray doesn't receive his flowers because of this. But another reason why I feel like Ray Longo doesn't get the respect he deserves is because he's extremely humble. And I'm not saying other great MMA coaches aren't, but it just feels like Ray is content with sitting back and letting his fighters get most of the shine. In fact, I don't even think he would care if he's regarded as one of the greatest coaches in MMA history or not. He's just someone who genuinely loves martial arts, and because of his knowledge and passion for the sport of MMA, he has been able to produce some incredible talent over the years, and I'm looking forward to seeing what more he can do in the future. But what do you think? Is Ray Longo the most underrated coach in MMA? And what do you think was the most successful moment of his coaching career? But that's a lot for now, so I'll see you in my next one. Bye-bye.